Okay, I think we're going to roll. Yeah. Hello, I'm Doug Shear, and I'm happy to welcome you to the Birdcliff Forum, a project of the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild in Woodstock, New York. This Zoom event is part of the series called Woodstock Masters, featuring today the artist Joan Snyder and gallery owner Franklin Parrish as interviewer. It's being conducted on Thursday, April 8th, 2021 at 6 p.m. The comments made by speakers or questioners reflect their opinions and thoughts and are not those of the Birdcliff Forum, the Woodstock Birdcliff Guild, its staff or volunteers. We're admitting you to listen and to see the event intended to last about 50 minutes, but not to appear. Your brief questions or comments are invited at the end of the interview in a 10 minute time slot uh, to submit them, use text within chat, which you can find at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Franklin will then select some and read them to Joan. You may include your name if you wish. The event is being recorded and will be archived. It will be shortly posted to the Birdcliff YouTube channel. I should add that uh, if you'd like to make a donation to Birdcliff to support our activities, you can do so by going to the website and where you will find a donate button. Art dealer and gallerist Franklin, Franklin Parrish founded his Ipanemus Gallery, now located on Manhattan's Upper East Side in 1986 in Washington, DC. He has curated and hosted many solo and thematic exhibitions over the 35 year history of the gallery, including an award winning exhibition of Linda Banglis's work in 2002. Critically acclaimed shows of works by Ken Price and numerous other group exhibitions examining works by artists associated with the West Coast Finnish fetish and light and space movements amongst others. Parrish and his gallery have worked with Joan Snyder, the preeminent abstract feminist painter with whom he will be speaking today since 2012, hosting solo, a solo exhibition, Sub Rosa in 2013 and producing that catalog and group exhibitions, Forrest Bess, Joan Snyder in 2017 and Mulberry and Canal, Joan Snyder, Keith Sonnier, and Jackie Windsor in 2019. In 2016, with, part, with partner Christopher Heijnen, Franklin founded Parrish Heijnen Gallery in Boyle Heights, Los Angeles. Parrish Heijnen hosted Snyder's first solo exhibition in Los Angeles later that year. In 2019, along with fellow New York City-based art dealer Nissel Boshin, Franklin founded Parts and Labor Beacon. Franklin. Hi, thank you. And briefly, I'll just um, say a little bit about Joan and uh, also my relationship and how it came about. Um, as we all know, Joan's career began in the late 60s after graduating Rutgers and uh, moving in with her fellow classmates, Keith Sonier uh, and Jackie Windsor uh, and Mulberry and Canal. Um, my first encounter with Joan's work was in 1981 at the Whitney Biennial. Um, it was a biennial chalked with material that had a great deal of hand wrought um, materials in it and it helped inspire the direction of my gallery that eventually started about five years later. Um, I later met Joan uh, in about 2011 through a mutual friend. We uh, hit it off on a lot of levels, politically mainly. And um, we began showing her back in 2013. Um, I then wanna just go right to the work and ask you, Joan, a few questions dealing with the early material and some of the directions you've taken. 
And I first want to talk about um, your use of drips in your paintings. And I'm going to start with this one, White Layers and Red Rectangle, 1969, and how you incorporate these gestures that all become part of the image and how they're applied, what mechanisms you use, what reasonings, and uh, just sort of talk about your experience in, in making these paintings. Okay, now I'm unmuted. Ah, good. <laughs> they, they had muted me. So you want to talk about the drips in this painting? Is that? Yes, yes. Did you hear me before or? Well, I, I was so worried about being muted that I was. Ah, okay, um, I just really want to talk about your use of these gestures. There, there are drips, obviously. We're going to also talk about how you're dissecting the stroke and how you're creating imagery using the elements of painting itself. And so these are early paintings of yours. Um, you know, you're coming really not long after grad school, developing your own voice, partly in reaction to what else is going on and a reaction against what else is going on in New York, uh, partly in reaction to uh, the people you studied with perhaps and partly in reaction to the people you were surrounded by. But your ideas developed really and matured in that period, the late 60s. And I want to talk about all those elements. Yeah. You know, um, when I look at this painting, I can tell you that it probably had nothing to do with any kind of reaction to anything. I mean, I was just following my own um, whatever was happening in the painting, you know, one thing was leading to another. And the very, I mean, I distinctly remember this painting, which is called White Layers with Red Rectangle. Um, I had it hanging on the wall on Mulberry Street. And I wanted to, it's like the beginning of the strokes, but I, I wanted to very carefully and gently lay down these white, Lot, you know, horizontal kind of layers of lines. And the thing that I remember so distinctly is that my wall was a tongue and groove wall. Mm -hmm. So I'm looking, I have this painting hanging up and I'm looking at this wall of white wood that's gridded. I mean, it's tongue and groove is like a, a, a vertical grid. Right. And there are drips on the wall from other paintings. And I'm looking at it and saying, oh my God, that's what I want my paintings to look like. Just like that delicate thing that's happening on that white gridded wall. So you can't, this is not a good photograph of this painting, but there are very delicate drips all over it. And that's really what, for me, what this painting was about. Um, you know, not to mention leaving this, leaving this secure red frame around it. You know, that, that mm -hmm. a lot of my paintings had that, that kind of thing in it. But, but anyway, the drips were really about this delicate thing that was sitting right in front of me. And then I moved on from there to, um, what I really consider to be, a, this was the next painting called Lines and Strokes. And what I, this, this was on raw, raw canvas and it has, it has a grid going down, a pencil grid. And the thing I was thinking about here was painting paint strokes. I mean, I wanted, I wanted to make paint strokes and then paint them. Um, and once again, I have very delicate drips coming down. I mean, this is this is not somebody that's being an abstract expressionist. This is, you know, this is much more controlled than that. And some of the strokes have spray paint, you know, are spray painted. So it, you know, each one is sort of has a different twist going on. 
And then there's there's uh, gridded lines with pencil. Is that correct? The gridded lines are with pencil. Yeah. 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 Is there a relationship to writing or musical scores or like and, and somehow organizing in that horizontal way that the pencil lines? I, th I to? think you know at the time I was teaching kids in Bedford in Bed Stuy, and they were making mm -hmm. a lot of paintings and drawings on line paper. And mm, I, was, right. I was very affected by child art and what the children were doing. And, and um, I'm not sure I was into the musical score idea, but I might have been at that point. I'm, I just can't remember. Hmm. This, this is another one where the lines are more visible. This is one that I, I mean, I remember exactly when I did this painting when Larry and I were in, I think it was called Glen Gardner in New Jersey, spending the summer. And I was painting in a garage and I remember every single stroke in this painting I did so carefully. And so, you know, it's just like, it wasn't like I laid them down. It was like each mm -hmm. thing was very thought out and very careful and the drips were very mm -hmm. delicately done. And this is not a big painting. This is maybe two and a half by three and a half feet or something. Right, right, right. And each one, I mean, it's all one image, obviously, but do you have a sense when you start it where you're going to go with it all and, and, you know, compose it that way? Or do you just let it evolve as you're working on it? It definitely just evolves. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. I think that some of the later ones, there might have been more of a more thinking about what was going on. This is called a letter to my female friends in 1972. And um, I think we were just beginning to talk about women and women's art and the women's art movement. And, um, you know, this, this one is, this is not as delicately done. This, this has a lot more, you know, more, energy more and, and you know just sort of letting myself um it's it's much freer i can see that mm -hmm. and then there's the whole idea of dissecting the stroke and and looking at it as an element in and of itself and at one point i know you related that to the way suzanne dissects a landscape for example um, and I wanted you to talk a little bit about the way you're dissecting. Well, I, the, the idea in my mind was called the anatomy of a stroke. And I wanted to, I wanted to make a painting, be able to make a painting so that you could see every part of the of, of the painting, you know, like you could see through it. It, it was like me inventing cubism or, you know, having looked at say, something but I want I wanted to be able to see the gesso the pencil line the, the the molding paste the gel you know and then finally the paint but I did want I did want a lot of things to be sort of um visible in terms of being able to see and mm -hmm. and then and and I'm I didn't you know I wrote on this painting. I, I wasn't writing on a lot of paintings at that point. I mean, I was writing on early paintings, but it's interesting to me that I wrote that on this painting. You wrote the I wrote the title the, on the painting. The title itself, yeah. Yeah. And pre previous to that, you're writing only on that verso and, and titling everything privately. Yeah, pretty well, I it's not true. I mean, in very early paintings I was writing different things on paintings, but not the stroke paintings. I wasn't really, I wasn't writing on stroke paintings. This is unusual, I think. Yeah, it's the only one I know. Um, can we just go back to summer? Is that possible? Great. So I wanna just get into this rows and the grids and there's just elements of this that I think emerge later with the uh, field paintings that I wanna sort of discuss now with you because they, what's come up in my mind is the sense of 
how planting is done in rows and how the idea of agriculture is organized in a manner where things are placed very purposely and very, um, you know, very intentionally to have space between them in order to grow. And I know that's probably the last thing you had in your mind when you did this painting, but organizationally, it seems to relate to how the later field paintings um, have developed. So I just wanna maybe just sort of plant that in your mind now so we can talk about that yeah, when we get to the field painting. Franklin, because I was, I knew that you were gonna talk about the field paintings and this is sort of going, jumping ahead a little bit. I, when I made this painting, I was not a gardener or a planter. Mm -hmm. Although I did, I did have a loft with 70 plants in it. So I shouldn't say that, but they weren't, it wasn't a garden that was laid out in any way. Right, right. But right. the thing that I remembered about the field paintings is that I started doing them um, in the early 80s. And it was after I had done a lot of very heavy, emotionally heavy, heavily laden paintings. And I remember when I, Molly and I moved out to Eastport, New York, and I said to myself, I've got to stop doing these heavy paintings. I want to get back to paintings that had the same feeling as the stroke paintings, mm -hmm. but it's got to be a different, subject. I mean, I just can't do those again. Surra there we were surrounded by um, bean fields. And I started making paintings of bean fields that were very liberating for me. We'll, we'll get to those. I mean, I know we have a few mm -hmm. coming up. Right, right, right. Yeah, I just wanted to sort of interject that in and, and then we can move on to the, to the next painting um, after that one. Yeah which is part of the series that uh, um, Weeping Magenta, which is in the back of me, is related to. But it's also very specifically dealing with drips in a, in a specific way. And, I, and it's a very, I know this whole series is a very emotionally charged series for you. Um, but I really want to talk about some of the processes and how you incorporate different materials, how you're gathering and uh, sourcing different materials to make these paintings and working in the drips at the same time. So, um, you know, maybe we can talk a little bit about the, um, the theme of this series, if you'd like, and if you'd not like, that's fine also, but really I wanna to get to the, the chromatic choices, the materials and the gestures. Well, the materials, this, this one is called, as you can see, it's called Love Mom. And um, Maggie just passed me a note saying some people were asking about sizes of the paintings. I, I, I'm going to guess it's probably about five and a half by six and something like that. Um, you can't really see in this painting, but there are lots of little areas with cheesecloth and there's there's thick strokes with glitter and there's writing in it. Mm -hmm. um, this series was, you know, I don't really want to talk about it too much, but it was done during mm -hmm. a, a, you know, a kind of a difficult time that um, mm -hmm. sort of, they were kind of anguished, but serene and, and, and kind of beautiful in, at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. All right, but um, I did want to talk about the, the colors, which are, this is a very distinct palette that you used in this series and um, right. somewhat new for you, if, if, if not, um, you know, a little bit divergent from some of the other things you've done. You know, um, I, I have no idea where it came from. I mean, it's, it is a different palette and, and it probably had to do with what was going on. You know, I mean, you, when you're an abstract yeah. painting, painter, you speak a different language. I mean, I, you don't walk in and say, oh, I'm going to make orange and red. You know, it's just somehow the language comes out in a different way. Um, and these, I don't know. I mean, I, I can't really, um, mm -hmm. I can't really say where the palette exactly came from. Right. A lot of magenta and orange and red and purple. Right, right. Um, 
we can move on to the next uh, slide. I, I, I put this painting in, even though we didn't plan it when Frank mm -hmm. was talking, but this is called O Elena. And um, realizing that I'm talking to the Woodstock community, I did this painting after, for a, a couple of months I worked on it after Elena died. And, and I know that um, she's somebody that's horribly missed in Woodstock and I miss her terribly a lot. Um, so I just decided to put this painting in so people could see it. Yeah, it's also a great painting. Thank you. Um, and, it, and it also incorporates everything we just talked about in terms right. of the strokes, the drips, the flowers, you know, it's, it's really a... And it's got... It's probably got... Sorry. It probably, it, it, it incorporates, you know, your time of knowing Elena, which is quite a while. It incorporates all those periods of your work. Uh-huh. And I, I forget the size, but it's probably six feet by seven feet or something. It's big. Yeah. Six and a half. Anyway, it's called O Elena and, and getting, so now we're moving back, kind of back in time, which is that after- after I did the stroke paintings that you saw some of, um, really how this painting happened is that I got kind of bored with the stroke paintings, even though there was a very long list of people that wanted them, but I, I just got very bored with them. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know why this has come up on my screen. Can you see something else on your screen? I'm no. seeing squares 1972. Okay, because I have this screen thing going on. Um, You're got, seeing people's comments. They pop up just for a minute in the uh, chat. That's not what I'm seeing. I'm seeing something that, that, of my own thing that came up. Um, but anyway, I'll, so I got kind of bored with um, the stroke paintings and decided I wanted to do, because what would happen with them is that, that I would think about them for a long time, make sketches, think, think, and then go into the studio and really finish them within two or three days. And I really wanted to make a painting that I would be working on for maybe a month or two months. And that's how I started making the grid paintings. You know, these specific grid paintings that we're gonna see a few of. This is called Symphony. Uh, this one's particularly um, important for me because it's the first painting of yours that I sold. Um, I think you're aware of that, right? Yes. Um, okay. This was uh, in the estate of Nicholas Wilder and we represent the estate and this painting came up and, and that's essentially how I got to know you circuitously, but this, uh, they're a great painting that we had. Symphony two, and we're gonna show Symphony seven and Symphony eight at some point. I'd love to um, get rid of this thing that came into my life here. Ah, okay, sorry. So- Creek Square. Creek Square was done after Larry and I moved to a farm in Pennsylvania. And um, I took the grids with me, but suddenly there was more movement on top. You know, I was probably thinking of, beginning to think of landscape or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And that's, that's the only way I can explain where this, where this came from because it, it does seem unusual to me. Is it going toward being related to a landscape or is it dissecting a landscape? I, I don't know. I mean, I, I, think it's, I think it's sort of a stroke painting on top with a, an orange mm -hmm. square interrupting the whole thing and then the grid on the bottom and something else interrupting that. I have no idea. I don't yeah. know if it's a just coincidence, but it definitely chromatically relates to the painting in back of you. I know, I, I just noticed. <laughs> I, yeah, well, unintentional, but boy, it's- uh, It's interesting, right? Pretty similar, yeah, yeah. And that's yeah. also dealing with, with the squares in the landscape, so. Right, 
That's so true. I'm kind of hearkening back. Yeah. So this is jumping to 2014. It's called Symphony Seven. Um, right. It's a very large painting with, you know, the rose. It, the rose became a big theme with me. And so this has four different, really five different roses, very large. Um, the last one is done on silk, just on a piece of silk with um, probably with crayon, you know, with oil stick. Right. He used a lot of different materials in this one, I remember as well. This, really this, you know, and... I've been using a lot of materials at up to at, at this point. There's there's silk, there's herbs, there's probably rose hips and rose petals and paper mache, you know, there are a lot of materials. Mm -hmm. in and yeah, and I did want to, I kind of wanted to discuss your process of collecting materials itself. Like you, you, you find these things and I, you know, anyone that's been to your studios, either one sees your collections of things like herbs and fabrics and, uh, roses and you know you'll you'll just collect things and you'll categorize them in a way and they become source material but the actual collecting of it like where does that begin and how's it how's it happen mm, god i mean i you know i've been putting stuff in paintings and when i was in graduate school i was i made a sculpture that had glitter and plywood and plastic roses right. and Fringe and you know, I mean, so I think that on and off, I'm not, I'm not saying I always did it and I always do it, but on and off, I put lots of material in my paintings. Um, I can't, you know, we're talking about 50 years of, of work, so I can't really pinpoint when I started doing that. But, but I can tell you that at one point, I was sharing a, a space in a building in Brooklyn with an acupuncturist. Mm. And she decided that the Chinese herbs, the loose Chinese herbs were kind mm -hmm. of, she wanted her patients to have capsules. She didn't, no longer wanted them to be cooking the herbs and all the smells and drinking them. And mm -hmm. but she literally gave me, it must have been like four dozen bottles of Chinese herbs. That was really a big deal. Um, I started making, yeah. I was making healing paintings for about two years. Mm -hmm. Anyone who was sick, you know, I would make a healing painting. Um, then mm -hmm. I, I started, this is not, stopped doing that. And I started just making, using them in paintings as material. And, and I actually still have this, some of this stuff. It's unbelievable. This was, right. this be, how many years ago? It had to be 30 years ago or something. Yeah. And do you still use them? I still use them. I do. <laughs> I they're in there. They're, they're, and they're in this painting. Yeah, that's what reminds yeah. me. There's some in the book. Yeah, I remember. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. This one's not from too long ago. That You know, they're twigs, our, all kinds of yeah. stuff, Chinese herbs. Um, but then that also connects with the planting process and, and really what I want to talk about when we discuss the field paintings and I don't know where we are in the slides but what's next oh that we have dark strokes so okay, we can talk about darks let's talk about dark strokes out because that's uh, a, a recent um, placement obviously with the, with the Tate Modern and it was uh, a very important transaction and also it relates very directly to uh, Smash Strokes Hope, which is uh, uh, at the Met. But this painting is one of those early ones you're talking about in which things are moving quickly. The, the, um, the process itself is a matter of days, not months. Um, and you're very expressively applying these colors and organizing them. But um, yeah, this is done, I guess, also in Mulberry Canal when you were there, correct? Yes. Right. You know, and, um, and at, this, at this point, I really was thinking about music and, and um, 
Mm. The idea of wanting wanting a painting to have many different feelings and emotions in it. I, I, I thought about beginnings, middle, and you know, the upper right hand corner was always mm. some kind of resolution. The upper left hand corner was beginning the painting. The lower right hand corner was always like the end of the painting. Um, so there was all that mm. going on. And I know, Franklin, what you wanted to also talk about was that handprint that's on there. Handprint, yeah. Because- That is what I want to talk about. I, I actually, yeah. when I saw this painting hanging in the city, you know, they had it up in New York for a while at Blaine Southern. And I was surprised to see the handprint in there. I, I didn't remember it at all, but there it was. And then over the years, it seems like I do that. There we go. It, yeah. So I do want to talk about these handprints and I want to speak about my feelings about them. And I want you to sort of correct me if you think I'm off base on this, but I really think they have to do with your relationship to the earth, with nature, with planting, with putting that imprint um, for others to feel and to set, have a similar sensory reaction. You're, you're not leaving a handprint for, for people to remember you by, but you're actually engaging and you're doing something to that surface. And in a sense, the painting surface becomes like the surface of the ground and you're actually trying to, to give something to it. I, I, you're not far off. Um, I don't know if I would describe it exactly that way, but I know what happened, how it happens. It happens because I have um, a rubber glove on. I don't always wear gloves, but when things start getting really muddy and messy and lots of pain, and because I do use mud in the paintings, um, and I have paint on my hands on the glove, I'll look at the glove and I'll think, wow, get that on the painting, you know, and then I go like this and, and it goes on the painting. So it's, I don't know if that sort of relates to what you're saying, but it, but it is me just noticing this beautiful colors and everything going on on my hand and then just wanting it as part of the painting. That's how it happens. Yeah, I, I mean, that's how it happens technically. I'm just talking really about what they mean and, and what you might mean with these gestures. And sometimes you're not even conscious of it, I think, that you're doing it. But I think for me, what I'm feeling is uh, you're being physically connected directly with your paintings, the way somebody planting is physically connected with your, your you're laying something in there to regenerate, to grow, and to give back. And I think for the viewer, the viewer feels that giving and, and feels that sense of engagement. That's, that's what it provides for me. It's not just sort of like, I was here. Uh, you know, here's my imprint, you know, I'll let Jackson Pollock. It's more of a sense of, this is something I wanna leave for you and you can take from it. Yeah, it's very beautiful. Does that make sense? Okay. It, it makes sense, I, yeah. I mean, it does make sense. I think that almost everything I put down is probably what you're, you know, what you're describing. Maybe yeah. Not, maybe not just the handprint, I don't know. Not just the handprint, but the handprint really deliberately does that and shows that. And it's, you know, if you, it's so different than Jackson Pollock's handprint. It, it's like night and day and that's, something I just wanted to remark on because it's a, it's it's a way you do a handprint that is I think mm -hmm. kind of unique to you, to you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, this is another handprint one. We we were picking out some handprint paintings. The river becomes a room. Oh uh, yeah. Again, it's a field, it's a landscape. Mhm. Mm and there's, there's several kind of those hand gestures in the lower left as well. Um, right. And water, you know, we haven't talked about this, but water is very um, significant in a lot of your paintings. Um, 
ponds and you know rivers and just elements of splashes of water that I've seen over the years. And this, but this one in particular, and um, and you're comparing the river to this enclosed space, which it is. The river is an enclosed space, and you're describing it as a room. Um, well, I got you on this. Maybe describe what that's about. Describe. Well, the, the idea of a river becoming a room, like, is it, is it about the enclosure of the water and, and like, I think where the title I, come from? I think that the, the title followed the last title, which was called The Summer Becomes a Room and this, yeah. The River Becomes a Room. I don't ne necessarily, I don't know. I mean, I don't know if I, it was very poetic to me. I don't know if I was thinking about enclosing the river in a room. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, just to give a shout out to Woodstock, because that's where I am. When, when Maggie and I lived in Willow, we were surrounded by ponds and water and streams. And we're not, we're not any longer, but that's really where I began doing all the pond paintings and, and the kind of the black ponds. Um, rivers, I don't know, I, I, I can't remember why I made a painting with a river in it, but I, lo I do love this painting. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, here's one of my favorites. Nature. Um, yeah, and I, I suppose this really gets again to what I was talking about, your connection to the earth. And, um, and it, the, the poem, uh, uh, remind me the, the poem that it references, um, the title. Um, Nature Remains? I don't know. I can't yeah. remember. Um, but the point is that when all else is gone hell, gone to hell, and we certainly have a sense of that over the last year, nature remains. It's, it's the one reliable thing we have. And I think this painting really is an ode to, to that sense of being connected to and relying upon nature uh, as a healing source and as a sustenance source. But um, there's a there's almost like a figurative image, um, you know, the, the blue. Well, there's a pond, like, there's a pond down on down on the bottom there, and then there's there's a a blue. Um, stick figure coming out of it with a little right. round pink mouth. Yeah. What, what's that stick figure about? What's the figure about? Yeah. Who is it? What is it? Yeah. You know, figures just happen. I, I don't know. You know, it's, I have no idea. It just, I guess it just needed that. I mean, and there, there's another to the left of that figure. There's a, there's a torso. There's a drawing of a torso that got pasted mm -hmm. in. Mm -hmm. There's um, a lot of materials on this one. Yeah, there's a lot. Lafia, sticks. It's yeah, very, it's it's got a lot of the Chinese herbs and materials and rose hips and rosebuds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And paper that's been drawn on. Um, there's there's a tremendous amount of collage in this painting. Yeah, and it's on it's on raw linen. You know, primed with rabiskin glue. Now we're getting to the okay. fields. Now we're getting to the fields, and, and we can talk about we we mentioned the organization of the of the planting and the, the sense of uh, of deliberateness in agriculture that sometimes sometimes you're referencing and the way you organize your strokes. Um, but this is a pretty clear example of that, and it for me it does relate a lot to the stroke paintings. Uh, from the early 70s and and how the, um, the the lines the grids helped organize the imagery bean filled with snow this one really uh, oh that's another one uh, this one 
is really dealing with that whole idea of the, the earth, the, the planted field emerging from the frozen, you know, the surface and, and, uh, and regrowing and, you know, re regenerating. Right. And that's that whole uh, kind of sort of in it now or coming out of it now. Um, right. and, and it's a really remarkable time because nature is pushing its way and, and it's a give take thing where its nutrients are kept in the snow and it's rising again. And you're really dealing with that whole idea of something that was dormant that's reawakening. Making me want to do beanfield paintings again. That would be nice. <laughs> that would be nice. Next. Yeah. And this next one, this is also water, isn't it? Am I correct? Is that a body of water? I think that, that the brown area is kind of earth. And I, I don't know if this one has water in it. This is Magic Meadow. It's, it's really a big flower field with um, a lot of dirt, you know, some dirt in the middle there. Mm -hmm. I don't think you I, have a tray at the bottom of this or like a, a this has a this has a wooden tray at the bottom that, um, catching paint that's coming off the painting and so it kind of looks I I always look at my floor and see how beautiful the floor looks and then I decide decide right. I think there's another painting coming up that I did it too yeah yeah a uh, sunflower where, where I just put a a piece of wood down and so it catches everything that's coming down instead yeah. of it going on my floor I mean it's going you know it stays in the painting yeah I love looking at your floor it shows right. a lot <laughs> <laughs> uh, this one includes a lot of text this is um, this is the whole William Blake poem called A Sunflower Weary of Time. I mean, it's a very beautiful poem. Mm -hmm. So I decided to make a big sunflower painting and, and incorporate all the words into the painting. Mm. It's, it's a, this is something. Painting. Yeah. This is a smaller pump, uh, pumpkin field painting. It's a relatively late one too. We stuck this one in because we're doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, I often go back to the pumpkin field thing. I don't know. I just like to make pumpkin fields. Well, it's late in the year as well for harvesting, which is interesting. It's kind of the opposite of the snow scene we just saw. Right. Um, but, you know, again, in terms of the organization and the way things are planted and the way things are deliberately arranged to have space, um, your work, you know, just formally relates a lot to some of the things that are done in agriculture. Hmm. Well, I'd like to have a huge garden and I don't, so I, I have a big paintings that have gardens in them. Mm -hmm. But I think, I think we could think of them as giving space to the different elements. And, and that's part of the reason. This, was this is the one, um, that was in London, is that correct? This was in London, yeah. Yeah. And once, I think you mentioned horror vacui, it's a, a feeling or sense that you had about this painting. Of filling in the space, you know, just filling yeah. in every space with- um, Filling in every space, yeah. An image with a symbol with, you know, just need, somehow needing to, um, to fill up the space and, you know, I just kept doing it and doing it. And this is what ha ended up happening. And then you decided it was the end, is that it? <laughs> and, then I, and then I wrote in the end. Yeah, I mean, I had to stop somewhere. And it seemed like a perfect thing. There was this big square at the end. And I said, what am I gonna do with that? You know, and, th and I just decided to write the end. Well, it's on the right, so that's that's where it ends. Yeah, that's where it ends. Yeah, yeah, I like this one. All right. um, now, now we're going to talk about figures. <laughs> Since we're breaking down everything into elements, right? <laughs> um, 
Well, this is a very different way than I usually give my lectures. So for me, it's interesting. I, I don't know if it's interesting to anybody else, but I, I, I mean, it's a nice way to talk about them. Um, this is Bedeck mich mit Blumen, and it is a field painting with a, with a figure in it. And I mean, literally what happened with this, how this painting originated is that I was walking down Canal Street and there was a flea market and there was somebody selling a box of um, cloth flowers, just a big right. box of flowers. And I said, I have to buy this box of flowers. I bought the box of flowers and I brought it home and I got my friend Ardell to come over and pose for me on the studio floor. And, um, and that's how this painting got born. So they sell the flowers. I'm assuming people were buying them individually, but you decided to buy the, the whole box. I bought the whole box, yeah. Yeah. Well, they wanted to sell them however they could. They, but... they must have loved you on, on Canal Street. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, on Canal Street. Thank you. Anyway, that's, that's how this painting happened. And I mean, I was always amused by the fact that Frank Stella once said that he would never put a figure in his paintings. And, and I, to me, it was like, oh, really? I would put a figure in my paintings. Why wouldn't you do that, Frank? Um, anyway, so that's part of what this painting was like. I'm going to put a figure in the painting. Right, anyway, right. Uh, and they, Franklin, they come up quite a lot. Mm -hmm. Franklin, yeah. I, I would suggest that perhaps you uh, see if you could take a few questions uh, okay. or comments from the audience. Great. Okay. We're, Thank you. You want to keep just show the rest of the slides while we're, we have yeah, a Yeah, why don't we do that? And we have the most recent. Um, And these are more recent. And this is another figure and a very recent painting that you did at the beginning of COVID. I guess we're not going to finish our lecture. I guess not. Um, let's see, how do I view the... Uh, well, Kerry was going to... Um, yeah, help. The, um, there's not very many questions right now yet. Oh, so. okay. Oh, then we can, we can keep going then. Why don't we, why don't we want to go? Where do you want to go, Franklin? Which one? I want to talk about these figures that are incorporated in landscapes because I think that's interesting. And, and they're, I think, all female figures. Am I correct? Um, well, Journey and, of the Souls is not female figures. That was done during the AIDS, you know, the AIDS epidemic. Mm, uh, um, this one. That is one. The Souls. Yeah. You know, there are a lot of woodcut faces on silk and on velvet and on paper, and and um, there's a very dark black pond. Um, but yeah. each soul is sort of connected to a peg and coming out with with um, strings of paint. The 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 black hole is a piece of velvet, I if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it you know it's a very large, heavy painting. Yeah, and it was a very dramatic time, and there were, we all obviously were feeling the, the pain right. of all these losses. Right. Um, but I just do want to comment on the black uh, quality of the, of the pond, because the pond has this mysterious nature. We don't know its depth, we don't know its origins, or, you know, where is it going and what can be in there. And this relationship to souls, I think, is, is kind of you know, interesting in that respect. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. where, where are the souls? And that maybe it's uh, somehow related to the pond. Hmm. But um, this is a, a, this is a, definitely a very, um, kind of a tribute painting mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. Yeah. We can, we can see who we want to in these, uh, images, but they're they're of past lives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, there is one question, um, sure. Lucille, and she's asking, "Do you make drawings in black and white?" Since she feels like the paintings are so much like drawings. Do I make drawings in black and white? Mm -hmm. no. Or you really talk to your process, I guess, of drawing for the if they're part of the paintings at all. I make a lot of sketches in small sketchbooks, usually when I go to concerts. And I have 
books and books and books of tiny little sketches and with notes and notes on color and it's all kinds of notes, but I, I, I'm not, especially lately making that many drawings on paper, no. But I do make a lot of notes and sketches and you know, I, I could show some, but I don't have them sitting right here. But they're not directly related to the paintings. Like well, they are directly they're related. Not, they're not steadies, I should say. They're like maps of the paintings in a way. I mean, they, they really are directly related. They, my, my thing with drawing often is that I feel like if I make a drawing and seriously spend time on a drawing, I'm not gonna make the painting. I've sort of shot it. You know, I mean, I've kind of put all my energy into the drawing. I'd rather make these tiny little sketches with notes and all kinds of things and, and then make the paint, make a painting rather than um, make a drawing. That doesn't mean I don't have flat files full of works on paper, because I do, but um, not lately. Next, <laughs> we better move. Yeah, I feel like we should show the most recent work. Yeah, why don't we do that? Yeah. So this right. one and then the right. next, and then see if there's any more questions, but not right now. And the next, show the next one, Carrie, the, the big new one. So, yeah, that's the gorgeous one. Symphony. Now you're just, that's still wet, correct? That's a it's brand still new one. Very wet, yeah. And the color's not great. It's a little glary, but I was playing, you know, this is, I shot with my iPhone today. Mm -hmm. So not great, but, but you get the idea. Right, right, and the plants and the, again, gestures of the, uh, the drips. And I don't know if we talked about the drips and how deliberate they are and how controlled they are. And um, they're not happenstance, they're, they're very much directed well, by you. Some are, some are very controlled and some aren't. I mean, like the middle of the right hand panel, it just had, you know, I just let it all come down. But sometimes I don't let that happen. I mean, it just, it's, depends, you know, that's, I'm in control of what the drips are doing. You know, depending on the size of brush, what I put on it, you know, how I lay it down, what's going to happen. It doesn't really, I can, I don't know, I guess I have, I have the painting right here. I mean, it's kind Let's of, look at it. maybe it'll look better. Well, we can see it. We get a sense of the scale there. Great. What is the circle form sort of in the center? You mean this? Yeah, what is it physically? Physically, it's a something I got at the local um, um, in Kingston, a, a store that sells cloth and material and it's a, it's a wooden hoop. Mm. It's okay. a wooden hoop that people use for, I don't, I, can't, I don't know what, but. For sewing, like when you're sewing something and you yeah, clamp sewing. it down in the hoop. It's, mm -hmm. it's got a nut and a bolt on it. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And then it's got a lot of burlap and paper mache and. Do you use acrylic? Some, uh, Judy is asking if the drips are acrylic. Are the drips acrylic? The drips are, um, can be acrylic and they can be oil. Um, they can be, you know, the drips are whatever kind of paint I happen to be having on my brush at the moment and letting drip. Well, you can drip acrylic, you can drip oil, you can drip anything. So. What else is in the studio today? Well, there's this painting in the studio. I don't have a lot in the studio to show you. Oh, I know what I could show you, a new print I'm working on. I'm working on a print remotely with a guy named Bob Townsend and um, we mail it back and forth. Mm. And it's called great. Black Lake. It's part of my black, I mean, it's related to the painting called Black Lake, but um, he and I, this is silk screen and etching. And he's got something like 10 plates already for this print. 
I don't know if you can see it, but it's great. Yeah, the middle it relates is... to the yeah, but it relates to some of those field paintings too. I think. Anyway, this is going to be a very small edition of prints, but I'm not done yet. I mean, I'm now I'm going to be drawing, doing some more drawing for it and mailing it back to him. And then he makes another plate and then he mails it back to me. And this is, this is pandemic printmaking. Other questions? They wanted to ask what kind of print that is. What kind of print? Like a lithograph or? It's silk screen and etching. Both. Etching lays over the silk screen. I'd like to jump in here and uh, use this moment to thank our interviewer, Franklin Parrish, and our Woodstock master artist, Joan Snyder. I'd also like to thank Judy Kerman, our Zoom operator, the Birdcliff staff, including Carlin Benson, the Birdcliff exhibition director, and of course, thank you all for attending. And Carrie Amarada, my wonderful assistant who- And Carrie. Thank you, uh, Carrie, yeah. And remember also that within a few days, this will be deployed to the Birdcliff YouTube channel so you can invite friends or revisit it yourself. Perfect. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, Ash. Thanks, Franklin. Bye. Thank you. Fun. Yeah. Thank you.